We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. excited to share uh, some of our work looking into the evolutionary links between physical activity and brain health. And we all know that physical activity has benefits to our physiology, literally from our bones to our brains. And I've become very interested in understanding more about why physical activity affects our brain health. Why is it that when we move our bodies, it can have benefits to our brains? And some of these benefits were first really detailed by Fred Gage in his lab, and, and Fred Gage is one of the founders of CARTA. And in the late 90s, uh, he showed with Henriette von Prague that if you give mice access to running wheels, you can actually lead to the generation of new neurons in the hippocampus, as you can see here. And the hippocampus is a really important structure because it's associated with memory, and it's associated with navigation and atrophy in this structure occurs during aging and is exacerbated by diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So finding that physical activity can lead to the generation of new neurons was a very uh, amazing finding. And it's since been shown that physical activity has similar effects on the hippocampus in humans. These are data from Kirk Erickson's work showing that a one-year uh, physical activity intervention in older adults led to increases in the volume of both the left and the right hippocampus. Now, it's not really clear whether this is due to neurogenesis or other mechanisms, but clearly physical activity has some effects on the human hippocampus. And in humans, physical activity effects are not solely found in the hippocampus, but there are associations between being physically active and having larger volumes of uh, areas of the prefrontal cortex, which are associated with executive cognitive functions. So obviously these beneficial effects of physical activity are really important for public health, um, but as evolutionary biologists, we're often really interested in why. Why is it the case that if you move your body, that can have an impact on the brain? And if we wanna think about this from an evolutionary perspective, and some of what you've already heard about today is that um, during human evolution, our physical activity levels shifted, likely when we became hunter-gatherers. And this is just one way of looking at those shifts, comparing daily travel distances in great apes compared with what we see today in human hunter-gatherers, that there are just big changes that must have occurred going from an ape-like lifestyle to a hunting and gathering lifestyle. And it seems likely that our physiology evolved to respond to these high levels of activity. So if we want to understand why physical activity affects the brain, we really want to put it into this kind of evolutionary perspective. And we might ask why physical activity impacts any organ. And we can, we can kind of answer that question by thinking about the adaptive capacity model, which suggests that physical activity is really a stressor and our organ systems evolve to adapt to these stresses to improve their capacity. So for example, if we think of our cardiovascular system, during exercise, our muscles demand more oxygen. That leads to adaptations in our cardiovascular system like increased vasculature or improved cardiac efficiency. If we think about our musculoskeletal system, when you're physically active, your bones experience higher forces 
that leads to adaptations in your skeletal system, like laying down more bone. And so these physical activity stressors have important effects. And as I just showed you, physical activity seems to lead to brain adaptations, but it's not entirely clear what it is about activity that's stressing the brain. And that's really what I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk today. And I've kind of split this question up into two separate sections, thinking about what it is that, that links physical activity to the brain. And I wanna start by discussing how selection might actually act on this system and think about some of the molecular mechanisms that might act as targets of selection, and then talk about why selection would act on this system. What is the advantage of linking physical activity with the brain? But I'll start with uh, thinking about molecular mechanisms. And while there are many mechanisms we can think about and choose from, I'm gonna focus on endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are endogenous compounds that act as agonists for cannabinoid receptors in the brain and in the periphery. And one of them, uh, anandamide, um, functions similar to our body's own form of the active ingredient in marijuana, THC. When it's produced, it activates cannabinoid receptor 1 or the CB1 receptor, which plays a role in pain reduction, in generating feelings of reward, and what we've recently learned is that this activation of CB1 receptors seem to play a role in both neurogenesis and in enhanced cerebral blood flow. So they may be a target of selection uh, for these exercise-induced effects. And in fact, we know that exercise increases anandamide signaling. These are data showing an increase in anandamide from before to after a running bout. So endocannabinoids make an attractive target for selection and there's some evidence that selection actually does link endocannabinoid signaling with physical activity. So data from Ted Garland's lab um, shows this kind of nicely. He, over the last few decades, has led a selection experiment where he's generated highly physically active mice by taking mice that run voluntarily long distances on a running wheel and breathing them together over successive generations. So over many generations, he's generated high running mice. You can See, this is one of the selected mice over here on the left, and on the right in this video is a, uh, one of the control lines. Clearly, there's a difference in activity. This, the high-running mice run up to 15 kilometers a day. And there's lots of their physiology that's been associated with selection for high physical activity, but his group has also shown that the endocannabinoid system has been selected in some way, both circulating endocannabinoids like anandamide as well as cannabinoid receptor one function. So selection has acted in this case to link um, endocannabinoids and physical activity. And we were interested in whether there's any evidence that this has occurred in humans. So um, we kind of started thinking about whether there might be convergent evolution of exercise induced endocannabinoid signaling. So we looked at endocannabinoid signaling after exercise in humans and dogs, which are two physically active species and compared that with endocannabinoid signaling after exercise in ferrets, which are kind of a more lower physical activity species. And we found some evidence that's at least consistent with convergent evolution that anandamide signaling increases significantly in humans and dogs after a 30 minute exercise bout, but doesn't increase in ferrets after that same amount of exercise. So this is evidence that, like I said, is at least consistent with convergent evolution. And at the time we thought, well, perhaps this is due to uh, the pain reduction benefits of anandamide signaling, or maybe even the rewarding elements of anandamide signaling. These are data that we collected showing that this post-exercise change in anandamide in humans is highly correlated with a post-exercise increase in mood. So maybe pain reduction or rewards were the real target of selection, but the data showing that endocannabinoids are associated with brain structural effects uh, caused us to think about whether perhaps exercise-induced endocannabinoid signaling may be involved in brain structural effects in humans. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the recent work we've done looking at whether endocannabinoids play a role in physical activity-related brain health in humans. We use a little bit of a different sort of um, analysis technique for this study. Here we're using genetic variation in endocannabinoid function in humans as kind of a natural experiment to look at endocannabinoids role in these effects. And we focused on the CNR1 gene, which encodes cannabinoid receptor one, the receptor that's activated by anandamide. 
And it turns out that there's a polymorphism in the CNR1 gene. So if you go along the genetic code of the CNR1 gene, at one point where most people have a G nucleotide, some people have an A instead. And that A, that switch to an A nucleotide, is associated with enhanced function of CB1 receptors. So we wanted to see whether this genetic variation affects the way physical activity might influence brain structure. That is, do individuals that are homozygous for that A allele, do they have a greater physical activity-induced effect on the brain than heterozygotes or than individuals that are homozygous for the G allele? So to answer that question, we use the UK Biobank, where we have access to, for about 16,000 individuals, neuroimaging, so brain MRI scans, as well as uh, accelerometer data uh, from wearable accelerometers on their wrist, which give us an objective measure of physical activity. And what we looked at was how physical activity influences different aspects of brain structure broken up by genotype. So in this figure, moving further to the right, uh, that suggests that physical activity has a greater effect on the volume of the brain structure, in this case, total gray matter volume. I've split this up by genotype, so the effects of physical activity on gray matter volume in individuals with the GG alleles, with the GA alleles, and who are homozygous for the A allele, which is associated with enhanced CB1 receptor function. You can see here um, an, an enhanced, a significantly greater effect of physical activity on gray matter volume in those individuals with enhanced CB1 receptor function. And that same effect occurs in different aspects of brain structure. So if we look at the left hippocampus and the right hippocampus, you see those same patterns where that AA uh, individuals have a greater effect of physical activity on brain structure. So it looks like endocannabinoids are playing a role in these physical activity induced effects on structure. We're also interested in some of the diseases that occur in the brain and whether physical activity can play a role in mitigating those. So uh, this figure is showing the effects of physical activity on dementia risk as they vary by this cannabinoid receptor genotype. We know that physical activity tends to reduce risk of dementia. In this figure, going to the left is greater risk reduction for dementia associated with increased physical activity. And this figure, this is from about 100,000 individuals in the UK Biobank. And we're showing that individuals who are carriers for that allele associated with greater CB1 receptor function have an even greater risk reduction for dementia if they're physically active compared to individuals with two of those G alleles. So these studies looking at the UK Biobank strongly suggest that endocannabinoid signaling plays a role in the physical activity-induced effects on the brain. So if we think about kind of our original uh, question of how selection might act on uh, physical activity in the brain, we know that endocannabinoids are upregulated by physical activity, and there's some evidence that selection can act on this system. Why selection was acting on this system is still an open question. Uh, certainly rewards and pain reduction are clear advantages of endocannabinoid activity during physical activity. But these brain structural events are kind of intriguing and suggest that may also be a target of selection. But if that's the case, then why? What is the advantage of linking physical activity with brain structure or cognition? And that's what I want to spend the rest of the talk on today. And I'm going to start by discussing a model developed by Gerd Kemperman. And this is a foraging-based model. Um, he and his group suggested that the advantage of linking physical activity with cognitive improvements is that, for example, in mice or other rodents, foraging actually requires both being physically active and using memory and spatial navigation. So that might give you that kind of advantage. And they tested this model by looking at neurogenesis in mice that had access to a running wheel and were then given cognitive challenges through cage enrichment. And they showed that if you combine physical activity and cage enrichment, you actually get additive effects on neurogenesis compared to either physical activity alone or enrichment alone. So we were interested in whether this same uh, linkage between activity and uh, cognition during foraging occurs in humans. And we know from work that we've done, for example, with Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, that human foraging is an incredibly complex activity that while being physically active, individuals have to combine motor system and control 
uh, spatial memory and navigation, executive cognitive functions, and include their sensory and attention systems. And so uh, we wanted to see whether we could tap into these demands, these foraging-based demands, and actually enhance the effects of exercise on the brain in humans. So to do this, I worked with Gene Alexander at the University of Arizona, and we developed the Aerobic and Cognitive Training System, which is a tablet-based game that you can play while you're on a stationary exercise machine. The game targets specific cognitive domains and neural systems that we think should be linked to foraging-like activity, so executive functions, long-term memory, spatial navigation. You're basically riding through this maze and answering questions on these placards. To see how this system functioned and how this, whether this system improves cognition, we uh, performed a 12-week randomized control trial of older adults, um, and we split them into four groups. One group we had doing this combined exercise and cognitive challenge. We call them the XCOG group. And then we compared cognitive performance changes in them with other groups. An exercise alone group who just exercised did not play the game. A group that just played the game and didn't exercise, the COG group. And then a control group that simply watched sort of neutral videos. And so I'm just going to show you some of the results from this study. These are changes in cognitive performance on a dual task test. This is a test where you walk and then do serial subtractions from a large number at the same time. And this test is uh, highly predictive of fall risks as well as dementia risk. And so here we've got um, in the control group, uh, cognitive performance on this test at baseline in blue, at six weeks during the intervention in orange, and at 12 weeks in red at the end of the intervention. And our control group showed no change across the 12 week period in performance on this test. Both the exercise alone group and the cognitive alone group showed changes in performance, improvements in performance across the total 12 weeks. So we do get some improvements if individuals exercise or play this cognitive game. But if we combine them, if we put the exercise and cognitive tasks together, we get some differences. We get, first of all, improvements in performance in a shorter amount of time after only six weeks. And then the improvement that we get over 12 weeks is actually double what we see in the exercise alone or the cognitive alone groups. So there's some kind of either synergistic or additive effect of combining physical activity and cognition. So building on our evolutionary model, we can see how interventions can actually be altered to enhance the effects of exercise on the brain. So kind of putting this all together, obviously there's a lot more work to do. Neither of these questions are fully resolved, but I think there's some evidence that molecular targets that are associated with brain effects seem to respond to selection for high levels of physical activity. And it's very possible that we can build on evolutionary hypotheses for why this occurs to actually enhance physical activity related brain benefits today. So again, obviously much more work to do, but I think just to sort of overall uh, conclude, um, physical activity seems to have shaped aspects of human neurobiology in really important ways. And I think we can use these models to improve health and well-being today. So thanks again to CARTA and to the symposium organizers. And I just want to thank all the colleagues that have helped with these projects and our funding agencies. Thank you.